Okay. This is Thursday, November 13, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Gail Turner. Welcome, Gail. Thank you, Maureen. Dan. May I ask when you were born? I was born April 18, 1956, in Melrose, Massachusetts. And what community do you currently live in? Wayland, Mass. Your marital status? I'm married. And do you have children? I have two stepchildren. Kara is 25 and Michael is 22. Tell us what Melrose was like growing up. Melrose was a wonderful, wonderful community. Um, my mother grew up there, got married, and raised her family there. My sister grew up there and raised her family there, and I believe her children are probably going to raise their family there. It was a wonderful community, and every time I go back, I feel like when I cross the line, I feel like I'm getting a big hug. It's just a really fun community. Is there any military background in your family? My dad was in World War II, and he went in at 17 as a medic, and I think he saw some pretty gruesome sights although he never really shared them with us, which I think is pretty typical of World War II. And um, so he was not that excited when I came home and announced I was going in the Air Force. Uh, what branch did he serve in? He was um, in the Marine Corps. And what theater? I, sorry, I no. don't recall. I don't recall. Mm -hmm. he, was, um, he was at Iwo Jima, I do know that. Pacific Theater. Yes, okay. <laughs> Again, we didn't talk a lot about it. He really became very quiet when we started talking about that. And that is, that is common, especially mm -hmm. when you're through that kind of hell on Iwo Jima. I'm, I've spoken to Iwo Jima veterans, and even those who can talk, talk very carefully about it. Yes. yes. So where did you graduate from high school? I graduated from Melrose High School, class of 1974. And when and where did you enter the military? I entered the military, um, well, I lived in Melrose at the time, but I believe we went through the Boston um, MEPS, I believe it was called. So we went through there for our physical, and I believe that's where we went and left for the airport and signed, you know, raised our right hand and all, I believe. It was many years ago, so I'm trying to remember things. <laughs> <laughs> was it after, I take it after high school? Yes, so, I'm sorry, okay. yes. It mm -hmm. was, um, I graduated in 74, in June of 74, and in December of 1974, I went to late enlistment, and then went off to basic training at San Antonio, Texas, February 4th, 1975. What made you go into the Air Force? Well, in high school, I was um, not real interested in the studies, but I was really good. I was, I was the pep club president, I was the majorette, and I was really active. But the educational part of it, I kind of forgot to really to work on. So I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And I guess I was supposed to go off to college because my two brothers and my sister was, was in college at the time, so I guess that's where I was going. But my friend Dolly, whose mother was a Marine, said she really wanted to go in the Air Force. And she goes, what are you doing? I'm going to the recruiters. I go, I don't know, I'm not doing anything. Off I went to the recruiters. I walked out, said, Mom, I'm joining the Air Force. <laughs> it was that quick. And I felt like I finally had direction. I felt like I was floundering. And um, as I said, I wasn't sure I wanted to go off to school. But my mother asked me, she doesn't ask much, and she said, would you try college for me? I said, okay, because I was already... Um, accepted into like community college. So I went, this is the joke of the family, day and a half I come back, I go, Mom, I can't do it. And uh, so, so off I went to the Air Force. It was the best decision I ever made in, in, in my whole life and everything's been a springboard from there. You uh, mentioned earlier that you pretty much signed up in Boston. Yes. And then you were sent to San Antonio. For basic training, yes. Tell us what that was like. Oh dear. Well, you know, there wasn't a lot of women, so we just had this small group of, there was I think maybe two flights of like 30 each, and the rest were all men. But we were separated there at the time. They were, we were not in the same building and all that. Um, the Air Force, 
um, basic training, unlike the Army, was not real physical. We mostly sat and learned um, school, school. We didn't do a lot of physical. And actually, the obstacle course was optional. We could go. We didn't have to go. But of course, we all wanted to go. It, we weren't um, graded or anything. So it was just really a lot of fun. Things have changed since then, I mm -hmm. must say. But um, um, they weren't quite used to with women. They weren't, weren't really quite sure what to do with us. So um, one thing I learned was that how little you can do with, how important um, a candy bar is, you know? And um, I just learned a lot about myself with, with discipline. I did things I never thought I could do. I never challenged myself like I did in the, in the um, Air, Air Force um, enlisted. But most of it we were just following you know, as enlisted, you follow. When I went off to, later on in my life, when I went off to officer training school, we had to lead. So it was a little different, but I was much mature by then. Um, and met, you know, a, a ton of people. And I hadn't been out of Melrose very often, so, you know, they go, you know, well, we had a split up to go to church. So everyone wanted to go to church because we got out of the dorm. So um, they go, okay, go to the Catholic Church. And you know, we're raising it here. We look around, there's like a, only a handful. I grew up with like all ca Catholic, Irish, you know, and that's just the way, that's just the way Melrose was. So it was, it was pretty um, interesting to learn that there's a lot that goes on be, beyond the walls of, you know, Melrose, Massachusetts. Now, Gail, you entered the military in the mid 1970s during the very last days of the Vietnam War. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the kind of prevailing attitude at that time. Well, the, that, that is kind of interesting because America wasn't real happy with the military at the time. So for me to even think that's something I wanted to do was you know, pretty outrageous. Plus being a female, kind of outrageous there too. But the beauty of the females was I could walk down the street and no one knew I was in the military if I didn't have my uniform on because I could wear my hair any way I wanted, but in the, in back in the mid '70s, everybody's hair was long. The only people that had short hair was the people in the military, so they really couldn't get away from it. And if people were, you know, unhappy with the way the war was going, I think they felt more of a brunt end of it than we did. We were pretty, we were on a base, and so we felt really, you know, comfortable then. And we weren't supposed to wear our, our uniforms off base, um, and that's pretty much to this day. I mean, you can wear it to and from, but you know. Don't stop and have a beer on the way. So, <laughs> so I think that still um, holds true. But yeah. so it was different. And what else did you learn while you were still in basic? Uh, I learned how to shine my shoes. I learned how to march. <laughs> um, I learned how to get along with others. Um, I learned the meaning of life. I, it was just such. A rude awakening. We were in our uniforms the whole time we were there. And I also want to mention, I went in the Air Force with a buddy, my friend, who I went to the recruiters with, my friend Dolly. We've been friends for like 45, 50 years. We're still very, very good friends. And so having her there, wow, that was so helpful. Most of these young women, 18, 19, 20 years old, got on an airplane and went down to San Antonio, Texas, not knowing what was gonna happen. I didn't know what was gonna happen, but I had my, my friend Dolly there. So anything in numbers is, 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 is much easier, and I found that through life. Indeed. Everything in numbers, yes. All right, you got through basic. Oh, Tell yes. us what happened next. Well, from there, I went off to Chanute Air Force Base in Rantoul, Illinois. I went to Jet Engine Mechanic School, and I believe that was about three months long. And boy, now that was a, an experience. And <laughs> what made you become a jet engine mechanic? Well, when I went to see the recruiter, they had just opened up 10 career fields to women that were closed. So I was 18 year old and you know, I go, yeah, that sounds good. I don't know anything about mechanics. I mean, that's good and bad. Um, and they were very interested in getting women in these fields. Um, so off I went, Jet Engine Mechanic School, and boy, now that was an experience. I really am not mechanically inclined, and I didn't do a lot of stuff. So I, I struggled, you know, just learning the basics, but then I did fine, you know, and everyone's there. The Air Force has, has a saying that, you know, 
if, if one fails, we all fail. And everyone helps everyone. You might be strong in something and help somebody, even in basic training. We helped, everyone helped each, each other get along because it was such a, a you know, uncharted water, waters for all of us. Same thing happened to basic training. Mm -hmm. Tell us a and little textbook. more about uh, mechanic school. The, what, uh, what kind of jet engines were you working on? Well, we, we um, studied the J-57, which goes into the KC-135 um, airplane, which are still being flown. And those are air refuelings. I don't know if you know much about the air, air refueling, but what they can do is they call them, they pass gas and, you know, <laughs> to the bombers to give them a drink, like if they have to go far distances, because um, fighters and bombers can only handle um, so much gas. So they get a drink halfway through on their way over to Europe or wherever they're going. Just kind of extends their run. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. And the KC-135 can carry, I, I know it's a, a huge number, I can't give the number, but huge. Enough for them and enough to share. So it's a pretty amazing aircraft. So you learned how to repair engines. And you I said, did. And you, as, that took about three months? About three months, yes. Mm -hmm. And we marched to school every day, and we marched home every day. So now you're in Illinois. Yeah. And what was that like? It wasn't Melrose. Uh, it was um, flat, and we got there. It was freezing cold, and I think that was in March. And then the next day, it was 95 degrees. It was the weirdest thing. Not to, not to have spring. We're so used to spring. We're used to spring and fall. So that was an um, in, in, in interesting experience. And then I knew I was going to jet engine mechanic school. I knew I was going to Rantoul. But um, maybe with three or four weeks left, you got your assignment where you were going to go. So everyone's you know, all nervous, you know, because people really wanted to go to certain places. My first choice was California, because I, as I said, I was judging a mechanic. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about California. I said, I want to go to California. I got Pease Air National Guard Base in New Hampshire. But as it turns out, I'm so grateful that I did, because I was near my family, and my family has been my biggest supporter through my whole career. So that was just, and the people in, in New Hampshire were just, you know, fabulous. And it was a really, really fun time for me. How long were you stationed at uh, Peace? Uh, three years. And what were your duties? I started in shop where you would build up and tear down engines. And then I went to test cell, which was one of my favorite places to work. And what we would do is we would fix the engines in the, in the shop, and then they'd take them out to test cell, and they'd put them on these stands, set them up like they're really they're in the airplane, and we would test the integrity of the of the, w the work we had done to see if it was ready to go on the airplane. So it was like it was on the airplane, except it was. So we would get to run them, um, and that was pretty pretty exciting. Now this takes us uh, when you first were stationed in New Hampshire. It's now what around the spring of seventy five. I went there in spring of 75 and I left in October of 78. So spring of 75 was when the Vietnam War pretty much ended. Right. Um, the GI Bill um, was through, I think it was June of 76. So when I went in, I had the, the, the old, G I always refer to it as the old GI Bill. But never, you know, it was, it was pretty much over by then. So you mentioned uh, GI Bill, the new GI Bill. What was? Uh, were there any differences? Well, I'm not too familiar with the new G GI Bill, but the old old GI Bill. They paid you to go to school, and then I worked a work study program. So I was getting paid to go to school, and um, paid to go to school, and I got to work at the same time. So it was a pretty, pretty, pretty good offer. And as I said, when I went, left high school, I wasn't sure where I was heading as far as the college went, but it was, I started taking classes and I just kept going until I got my degree. While you were stationed in New Hampshire, what was your rank? I was a staff, no, buck sergeant, buck sergeant. 
I got married too, to another Buck Sergeant. We were Mr. and Mrs. Buck Sergeant. So we went off to um, Alaska together. Honeymoon or next post? Next post. And six stripes could live as cheaply as three? Uh, well, no, we got, we got married in May of 78 and then left in October of 78. Okay, tell, uh, where in Alaska were you stationed? I was at Elmendorf Air Force Base, which is in Anchorage, Alaska. And I kind of fussed and moaned about going, being so far away. And then we loved it so much we extended, we stayed six years. Six years? Yes. Yes. And were your duties in Alaska the same as in New Hampshire? Um, I, when I first got there, I worked in Phase Dock. And Phase Dock is where um, <clears throat> you just, it's like giving your car a tune up. You know, they would come in so many hours and we'd have to like tune it up. And that was okay. But um, from there, I went back into in shop maintenance, which I, which I liked. But from there, my, my second favorite job was job control. And we would um, we would facilitate we would coordinate all the maintenance done on the flight line, from um, getting the electrician out there, from getting the hydraulics person out there. Um, we would um, you know give them clearance if they were all set, then ATC would take over. But it was pretty it was twenty four seven, and it was really constant because we had a, we had fighters up there, and we were. Um, we were, very, we were very busy up there. We used to call ourselves the top cover of America, being up there in Alaska. So that was a really fast-paced job. And I remember they asked me to go for an interview, and I walked in in the middle of something, and there was people, not yelling, but you know, trying to get the job done. And there was people on the microphone. There was people like, oh my god, I'm never going to be able to do this. It's too much. I went in. It was probably the best job I ever had. It was really fun. Mm -hmm. So although this is now the end of the Vietnam War, we're yes. still pretty much in the heart of the Cold War. Yes, yes. And of course, Alaska is a little bit close to the Soviet Union. Yes, yes. So tell us what a uh, little bit about that. Well, I know that we were pretty close to. We had a lot of. Um, I don't know. They were just sites. Um, there was um, uh, King Salmon had a site. Galena had a site. So there would be people even closer than I was. I mean, you could. Mm -hmm probably look across and see. Um, but we were, we were on alert a lot. Probably pre preventative, we were on alert a lot. So we were, as I said, we were pretty much a 24-7 operation up there. So, but it was always very fast-paced and very, I don't know, it was very exciting, you know? So you were in Alaska for six years, which would bring us to 1984? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you get a promotion or any? Yeah, I yeah I got promoted to staff sergeant. Okay. I think that was in Alaska, and then we went to Castle Air Force Base, in Atwater, California. Now you get to California. Right, right. So that by this time you've been in the Air Force now for close to ten years. Yes. Yeah. Tell us what happened. Well, what happened was, I really honestly wanted to be a recruiter. I thought that would be the best way my career could go. And I applied for it and I had, um, I had um, letters of recommendation from pretty high people. So really I thought I was in. So I mean, I was this close to being a recruiter. And they say, wait a minute, you have a, a bonus in your career field because we were a critical career field, jet engine mechanic. I go, well, I just won't take it. They go, no. you." You have to take it, or you have to get out, or you have to um, cross-train into a more critical career field. And I go, oh, I don't think this is going to work for me. So I made the decision pretty, pretty fast. I go, I'm out. I got out. And I was angry, and I was frustrated, and I go, oh my god, I would have been the best recruiter ever. So then I calmed down, and I... Um, went into the, in, back into the guard. So I had a small break, went back into the guard, and that started my, my Air National Guard career. So I had 10 years active and about 20 years guard. 
and with the Air National Guard here in Massachusetts or? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yes. Okay. I ended up back at Pease. <laughs> and hopefully they welcomed you back with open yes, arms. Yes, open arms. They were happy to have a fully qualified jet engine mechanic. So I went back as a jet engine mechanic. But my goal was to finish my degree and to become an officer. That was my goal. So you were taking classes all along the way. All along, all along the way. I was under the 10-year plan. Uh-huh. But I did it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When did you get your degree? I got my degree in 1989. And what was your degree in? Psychology. From what school? Well, I went to five different colleges, but ended, because I was, you know, traveling around, but I ended up putting all my credits together and ended up graduating from UMass Boston. Mm -hmm. Yes. Lucky me, that was a great school. Really good to veterans. And still is, I yes. understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just there, um, where was I, when was I there? Um, Monday night. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened now. <laughs> what happened now? Where were we? Oh, I graduated. Yep. Oh, mm -hmm. well in the Air Force, you have to have a degree, a four-year degree, before you can apply for an officer position. And the pos officer position has to be available. They just don't make officers and then find you a position. There has to be a position. Then they make you an officer. So I graduated and um, everything just fell into place. I'm fighting the age thing too because I was 33 and I had to be, re mm -hmm. I had to be commissioned by the time I was 35. Mm -hmm. So the next weekend I went for an interview and got the position. So then the paperwork all started rolling, and it took from, I think, June, and then I went off to OTS in um, the following January. They ca actually call it the Academy of Military Science. Okay, so this is what, 1980s? 90. 90. 90. Yes. Okay. Yes. And where was Officer Training School? It's in, um, is it Knox? No. Knoxville or Montgomery, Alabama? I've been to so many trainings. <laughs> I'm trying to think. So that was, uh, that's a little blurry right now, but it was in the South. <laughs> and tell us what officer training school was like. Well, it was very different from um, enlisted. Most of the people that I was in officer training school with were enlisted like me. There was a few that never had any um, military experience. So, um, it was a, a mature group. You know, I thought for sure I'd be the oldest person down there, and I wasn't. I was close to the oldest, but I wasn't the oldest. But a lot of experience a lot, and a lot of um, enlisted wanting to do what I was doing. You know, they, they got their degree, they spent time enlisted and said, I really want to try for the, for, for, for the, next, for the next, like, brass ring. So, so we, there was 38 of us that graduated together, and to this day I still am in contact with some of them, which is really fun. You got uh, your commission? Yes. Second As a lieutenant. Second lieutenant. Yes. Tell us what happened next. Well, I think that was, um, that was the high point of my career, mm -hmm. I think. What happened? I went back to Pease. Back to Pease. Back to Pease, and I became the human relations officer there. And what did that involve? Well, basically, it involved um, drug and alcohol, sexual harassment, um, you know, a training. We did a lot of training, basically. Mm -hmm. And if there were any issues, uh, we referred to ourselves then as the eyes and the ears of the commanders. We'd kind of be out and about. If we saw issues brewing, you know, you try to resolve them before they became full-blown issues. So that was a, a pretty good um, t time in my life, and at the same time, I needed a job, because I didn't have a job, a full-time job. So that's when I um, was hired by American Airlines. So I had dual careers going. And when you're in the Guard, you can, because I was a part-time Guard person. And what did you do for American Airlines? I was a flight attendant. I was hired in 91. I'm surprised they didn't get you for being a jet engine mechanic. Yeah. Well, I, was, I, wanted to be, I wanted to come inside, I said. Ah, you know, mm -hmm. I want to come inside, but I know a lot about the airplane, so if there was issues, I could... It was funny, because a lot of the people in the cockpit were fellow um, 
guard people, you know, so they knew what I could do. And I would call them and I would tell them things very specific <laughs> that was going on. It was kind of funny. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Coffee, tea, or wrench. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So that was a great career and I just retired last year from there. So I had two careers going on at the same time. While you were uh, with American Airlines, uh, what, were there any specific routes that you would take? Or? I started with them and I did international. And I did that for about a year and then I came back domestic and that's pretty much where I stayed. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what was that again? Um, internationally, I and flew then, for about a year and mm -hmm. then I came back to the d domestic side. Oh, domestic, with American, okay. it was one or the other. Mm -hmm. They have changed that since but since U.S. Air bought them, now they're domestic and international, but didn't have to do that. So let's get back to oh, Keys, yeah. yeah. part-time human relations officer. Yes. And how long were you stationed at Pease? Till I retired in 2004. After I had the job, um, when I I had the human relations job, which was great, and then I applied for a position. It was the um, executive officer for the maintenance squadron, which is really where I started. So I went back to maintenance, and I stayed in maintenance until I retired. And did you get promoted? Yes, I did. So second lieutenant, and then I uh, first lieutenant, and then I, my next job was the Logistics Support Flight Commander. It's probably a captain then. And then I got promoted to Major. And then I took over the Maintenance Squadron. And what were your duties when you were heading the Maintenance Squadron? My last position? Yes. The maintenance squad. Well, we had 263 people, and I was a part-time commander. So I had very, very strong chiefs. And... Well, we took care of, we took care of everything. We supervised, so I suppose you would say I supervised the people that were fixing the airplanes. So I went to the other side of the spectrum on that one. So then I became the boss of all the people I used to work with. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. What were you doing uh, when the terrorists attacked? on September 11, 2001. Well, you know that was Flight 11, American Airlines, that went in. The whole plane was full of my friends. Oh my so God. that was awful. I was home. I, we had just had um, military weekend. It's called um, Unit Training um, Assembly. It's UTA. And it was a Tuesday. And just I just went through um, some, so I went through some, I forget what kind of training I went through, but it was for training for like terror attacks. It was really pretty weird. And I was at home, it was like quarter or nine, I was on the computer and the TV was on and you see that first plane go in and you go, you don't say any, you don't even know, is it a, well, we all know how we felt. So then I kept hearing Flight 11, American Airlines, and I know that's out of Boston. So I run on the computer to see who was on the flight. They had already blacked it out. So we didn't know who was on the flight. It took us a long time to find out who was on that flight. I'm getting phone calls like crazy because they're wondering if I'm on that flight. And I were, and you know, the other, I had a lot of friends up at, that were pilots up at um, Pease that were American pilots as well. So everyone's making calls trying to find out who's on that flight. So everyone was accounted for from our guard unit. And, um, it was just the most awful day, awful, awful day. So, um, of course, we're down airplanes and we're down people. And also, they offered a, um, it's called the overage leave. It was something they, it, they put in and I took it. And I was, I pretty much was in New Hampshire after that, almost full time. So I took a three year leave from American. And in um, December of 2001, I, um, I, um, I deployed to um, Spain. And what, what we had there was we had a, a minimal base there. 
and then it got really ramped up because we would do maintenance on the airplanes um, going going back and forth instead of them coming all the way back to the States. Do you we remember do that. where in sta uh, Spain you were stationed? Yes, I was in Maroon, Spain. It's just outside of Seville, Sevilla, Sevilla. I know you were on international flights with American Airlines, but I believe this was the first time you were on foreign soil. Uh, what was that like? Um, well, we traveled quite a bit with the, mm -hmm. with the, um, with the guard. We deployed to Germany. Um, you know, you know how they say two weeks a year, mm -hmm. and then you know one weekend a month. Well, before 9-11, we would deploy to Germany for two weeks. We deployed to Denmark. We deployed all over. Lucky us. <laughs> really? Well, we, our plane would go, and we'd go mm -hmm. in it. You know, it could hold, you know, the whole, a whole bunch of, bunch of folks. So, so I was really lucky, and I got to travel, travel quite a bit. But I've never been on foreign soil in a war situation. Now, that was another thing. We didn't know if we were going to have to bug out. We had, we had army people coming through, and we didn't have room for them, and they were sleeping in tents. I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing. It was a, a pretty scary time for all. Of course, you were still uh, in New Hampshire when the United States invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and I take it peace was part of that? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a lot, of, a lot of people that were deployed. I never deployed to um, Afghanistan or Iraq, just Spain. Mm -hmm. And I was the maintenance officer over there. Mm -hmm. So you have on top your oh. uh, retirement. This is my, this is my retirement um, booklet. Uh -huh. That's one of my first pictures when I was, I don't know, I was probably 18 or 19 years old there. So that was, pretty, that was a pretty amazing day. Mm -hmm. It just has all my, I have a couple of pictures I can show you. Go right ahead. Great. Well, I, I wanted to tell you like two funny things in, in the- Go right ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, as I said, the military really wanted the women, but they really weren't ready for us. Mm -hmm. And they weren't ready for us, I say, especially uniform wise. You know, I had to wear steel toed shoes because of my job, but my feet are at seven and the only size I could get. So it took, so it took a while for that to all catch up. And the, sh you know, the shirts, we used to have these shirts and the pockets would tuck in and that would be the smallest shirt that I could get, you know. So it was kind of, I mean, you know, it, it was. Um, so this is, this that's is, that's when I went through basic training. I don't know if you can see that, Dan. And then, so those are all the, and all the women. And which one were you? Gosh, well, I had to put my glasses on for this one. Okay. Oh, there I am right there. There you are. I'm right, right there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And that's my friend Dolly I told you about. Hello, Dolly. Yeah, hello, Dolly. Yeah, that's true. Sorry, that just came out. <laughs> it did. We say that all the time. She'll get a kick out of that. And this is when I went to Jet Engine Mechanic School. This is um, a C5 engine. So we got to be in there. And there was another girl and me, and the rest are all guys. And this shirt... The, um, the pockets tucked right into my pants, probably down to about there. So that was always kind of, that Those was always like a big pockets. joke. Those are pretty deep pockets. Those are very deep pockets, yes. That was before we had the um, BDUs. And what does BBU stand for? Battle dress uniform. That's oh, the BDU. BDUs, yes, yeah. And that is, um, that's when I went through officer training school. And which one are you? Um, always, there's me. Okay. That's my roommate, Jill. We're still, we're still friends. It's funny, Va Va uh, Veterans Day, Facebook can be a real positive thing, and um, everyone was kind of contacting each other. It was really kind of nice. And um, I went through squadron officer school, and that's squadron officer school right there, and there was another female, and that's Sandra, who I'm still good friends with, and that's me. So it's always like, Sometimes just me as the girl or me and another girl, you know, so that was kind of a... Um, in your whole career, you've seen very, it's been an interesting um, period in the American military as women get in more expanded roles. Yes. And in the roles that formerly were men only. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think if, if you can do the job, you do the job. We train and train and train and train and train. If you can do the job, I feel 
you should be able to do your job. Um, this, this picture was, um, I was company grade officer of the year, so that was, that was kind of a, that was up at peace and that was really fun. And this will be my last one. This is when I took over as a logistics support flight, flight commander. And when you do that ceremoniously, you get the flag. Ah. So this was my commander giving me the flag. Mm -hmm. And then every time you take, every time there's a change of command ceremony, that is part of it. Yes, I remember uh, attending one of those ceremonies at Natick Labs a few years ago. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry? Uh, Colonel Cariotto. Oh, so she took over a... She, uh, she was garrison commander, and I was at the ceremony when she handed off the flag oh, to yeah. her successor. Yes, it's very, it's very emotional and exciting at the same time. Oh, I told you I was going to tell you one funny story. Go right ahead. Okay. When I first went in, I was up at Pease, and you know, um, I said you couldn't really wear uniforms off base. So um, it was payday, and believe it or not, we got a check. And we'd all go to the bank, and we'd go to the drive up, and we'd get these little envelopes, and our money would be in it. I don't even know how much was in it. But one day we said, we're going to treat ourselves. We're going to go to Burger King, but we're going to go inside. I go, oh, I don't know, you know? So I go inside, and we get our food, and I'm really nervous the whole time because I'm just a young airman. So I, I'm coming outside, and I see this guy. I go, oh my God, I think that's an officer. What do I do? So I gave him, I rendered him my best salute. And it was the it was the postman. He had this blue on with the blue hat. So I gave my I gave a really good salute to the postman. So that was the last time I went off base with my um, with my uniform. <laughs> I was such a scared you know eighteen year old kid. Consider it practice. <laughs> it was practice. It was pretty good. What have you been doing since two thousand and four? Oh my gosh. Well, I continued working with the airline. I just retired from them last year. And, you know, I travel a lot, and um, I'm just, you know, I'm very fortunate in my life. I understand you're um, involved with the Mass Women Veterans Network. Yes, yes. And um, what do you do with them? Well, there's a steering committee. I'm not on the steering committee, um, but you know everyone else that's on the steering committee, but I, I wasn't able to commit the time for that. So if there's like, I saw you at that e event at the State House. If I'm going, I go early and I help, and I help set up and I help put down. So I just, I help when I can. But that's been a very um, great relationship because I get to see a lot of the same people all, all the time and it's, it's mm -hmm. just a great. For those who are not familiar with the Mass Women Veterans Network, uh, would you care to say a few words about it? Well, I'll tell you what I know about it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a network of, of women in the area and it helps. Sometimes veterans don't know what they're entitled to. I know I've learned a lot um, from what uh, they're entitled to. Um, and they get this information out there, and it's just, I think it's been very, very helpful. I know they do a ton of other stuff on a full-time basis, but I don't know everything they do. But I know that you can go on their website and find out anything you know, and if you ask somebody, somebody will tell you where to go to find the information. And I don't think that, that hasn't been out there for, for everyone, so it's been a really lear good learning curve for me. Uh, Gail, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say, uh, such as uh, how important has it been for you to serve in the military? When I first began, I didn't know how important it was to be in my life. I feel it's been a springboard for everything that I've done, all in a positive way. I've met so many wonderful people. I've done so many wonderful things that I never would have done. Um, and I'm so proud of this country and I'm so proud to have served. And I love talking about the military. I'm the only one on my street that has the American flag out. That makes me sad, but I'm trying to set a precedence here and hope everyone does it. And I, I couldn't be happier or prouder. But be, one thing I want to mention is, I just want to tell you about my hero in my life. My, I've met it says, you know, who's somebody that has made an impact on you? I, one of those okay. questions, and I said, well, we don't have three hours, so I can't pull out one person, because everyone, you know, as they say, it takes a village. Well, a village has helped me in my career. And, um, but my biggest hero is my sister. 
my family has always been very supportive, um, my brothers, but my sister has been my biggest hero. She's been my biggest cheerleader since I was born. And she wasn't in the military, but she supports everything the military does, both um, physically, financially. She's just always been there. She's always been my hero. And I, you know, you make some good choices in your life and you make some bad choices. She always supports my choices, no matter what they are. <laughs> and what's the hero's name? <laughs> Kathleen. Kathleen. Her name is Kathy. And uh, she's the best friend and best sister anyone could ever have. So I didn't want to let this time pass without thanking her. And for those who are going to be watching the interview in the near future, mm -hmm. especially those who may be a little younger, uh, any sage words about joining the military? Well, I believe that everyone should go through basic training. I think you learn so much about yourself. It ma just makes you a stronger, stronger person. And it's just a, it's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great way to go. And I think if you talk to most military people, they'll agree. And I think we're kind of losing that unfortunately. So I, I, when I talk to kids, I always talk to them about, you know, the military. They love to hear the military stories. They love to hear um, how, you know, how, how dedicated, you know, you become when you um, are a member of the, of the military and just everything that comes from it. Education. Uh, oh my gosh. It's just, it just, it's, it's this big, yeah. everything. I think my world would be this big and with the military, it's this big. Mm -hmm. So I always say, lucky me. Yeah. Um, I almost forgot to ask, aside from the Women Veterans Network, did you join any other organizations? I joined, well, there's a club in, in New Hampshire called the Mission's End, and that's, I've joined that. Um, I was a member of the VFW in New Hampshire, and I'm, I'm no longer a member of, of that because the distance was just, um, just too much. But I would certainly support any, any like any, um, um, you know, our friend Kathy. We've been working with the Sheridan House in uh, Worcester, and that's been a really um, um, great project. And that's the for um, homeless women, veterans, and families, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing. So they have children living there as well. Tell us a little more about the Sheridan House. Well, it's. Uh, it's, it's part of Veterans Inc. And they have, I think the, the men's is in, um, on Grove Street in Worcester, which I'm not, 100, I'm not really familiar with that, but um, the, the Sheridan House is homeless women veterans that can bring their children, because most of these places you can't bring children. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and so I believe it's the only one in the area or maybe in the country that allows them to bring their children. Right now there's 14 women and three, um, three boys that live there with their moms. And uh, we go and visit and it's, it's really fun. I ask that because you hear the statistics about women veterans becoming the, the most rapidly growing segment of the veterans population and they have their own share of challenges, especially um, homelessness. Yes, yes, and, and I don't think they were quite ready. I think they, again, it goes back to when I went in, they really, they wanted us, but they really weren't ready for us, and I'm not, I don't believe they're ready for as many women that, that need the help, and we were at the same thing on, uh, at the State House, and we, that, that lovely woman that was talking about the challenges, she's, she's um, hit with cancer. Yes. So I think that is something um, that is something probably that's going to have to grow in the future. What Gail is referring to is the annual uh, women's veterans uh, ceremony at the State House that's held on the first Thursday in November, in which the Deborah Sampson Award is presented to a deserving veteran, and there's also a keynote speaker. And I really wish I brought the program downstairs because I could at least give you the names. But uh, the woman uh, that we're referring to is, uh, was a combat medic in Iraq, Afghanistan. And she is about to, was about to get married. She's go undergoing chemotherapy yes. for a rare form of cancer. She is also pursuing a master's degree in nursing. And if you uh, ever get the chance, perhaps it will be on YouTube uh, oh, okay. very shortly. Mm -hmm. It's and it was an incredible speech. 
There was not a dry eye in the house. I know my eyes weren't. Um, no, <laughs> it was it was really incredible. And it's events like that that bring these things. Um, and and she is determined that this is not going to happen to somebody else. And that's what these events do. Mm. So you know, I tip my hat to her. It's quite a gal. Very. Yeah. Gail, is there anything else before we wrap up this interview? Well, I could talk for a few days on it, but I don't think we have the time. So I think, I think we can call it a day. And thank you so much for the time. Well, thank it's been fun. Well, thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you. Okay.